Well, have you ever been the center of attention? Have you ever been the center of attention in a really good way? Maybe you did something incredible and everybody's calling your name and complimenting you for the amazing thing that you did. Well, have you ever been the center of attention but in not so great a way? That you're the object of scorn, where it feels like everyone is looking at you but you feel totally alone. A time when no one would speak for you or stand up for you. The truth is, to one degree or another, we've experienced those feelings in our lives. Maybe not with the same intensity as described in our gospel reading, or in the celebration of Palm Sunday where you have crowds of people calling your name, but we've had that to varying degrees in our lives. And perhaps the best place to think of this is school culture, right? In a school is where perhaps you're most likely to do like one cool thing and then you become the talk of the school. Maybe you made the game-winning shot in the basketball game, or you asked out the girl, you're the winning homecoming king or queen, and everybody is talking about you. And we kind of like it. Feels good. Feels good to be the object of everybody's jealousy, and feels good to be praised for the things that we've done. But we also know that it's the place where if you do one bad or embarrassing thing, you also become the talk of the school, but maybe not in a way that you like so much. And not in a way that makes you feel part of anything. In fact, it has the opposite effect. It makes you feel totally alone. Well, our Savior knows exactly how you feel. Today and throughout this Holy Week, we recall and remember when our Lord Jesus was the center of attention in a good way, as today we celebrate on Palm Sunday and the singing of hosannas, but also in a bad way, like in our gospel reading as he stands before the judgment seat of Pilate, and on Good Friday when he's the object of ridicule and totally alone. But today as we look at the gospel reading, we're going to meditate on it, and we're going to meditate on two truths in particular that it teaches us, that can help us deal with these kinds of situations in our lives. Because of Jesus, number one, things are not what they seem, and that's a good thing. And number two, that we are never really alone, even when we think we are. Not anymore. So today, our service began with our reenactment of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus is the center of attention. He's being praised and adulated by the people of Jerusalem. He's coming into Jerusalem as a king. And as the kids so rightly pointed out, they're all excited because the Messiah, the king, is supposed to show up in power and get rid of their enemies, the Romans. But then we got to our gospel reading today, which is a partial reading of the passion of Jesus in the book of Matthew. And now Jesus, he's still the center of attention, but now he's standing before the Roman governor Pilate and the very same people who are just calling his name in joy and adulation are now yelling, crucify him. The attention has changed. What happened? It wasn't a very long time between the triumphal entry and this trial. And if we were reading this like any sort of novel, we'd assume one of two things. One, the hero, Jesus, did something bad, and he's being rightly judged. Or, the hero has been plotted against, and the public has been deceived into thinking that he's bad. Well, in this case, somebody has plotted against Jesus. The Pharisees have conspired, and they've been looking for a way to get Jesus arrested and tried for a while, and it's only become more urgent for them because now he's raising Lazarus from the dead, and people are beginning to notice that he can do things nobody else can do, hence his greeting on Palm Sunday. Well, now this nobody from Nazareth is becoming a problem. He's too dangerous to be left alone. He's too disruptive for the religious establishment We can't let him go on. And so we find ourselves 
with Pontius Pilate, and Jesus is on trial. And it seems like the good guys are losing. Yet, everything is not as it seems. And our first clue to how we know that to be the case is Jesus is no longer speaking. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't answer the questions of his charges. We know he could, and we know he could say it in such a way that his opponents would have nothing to say about it. He's done that on regular occasion throughout his ministry. Yet Jesus rarely speaks in the 55 verses of our gospel we read today. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. To the point where Pilate is amazed that he doesn't respond to any of these accusations. Because Pilate, you can see throughout the text, has a sense that this is kind of a trumped up thing. That they aren't really doing this in good faith. So he's not eager to condemn Jesus. And he doesn't see what Jesus has done to merit the the charges and the accusations that are being leveled against him. Later in the account in verse 23, after he's tried to release to them Barabbas, and he wants them to choose Jesus, and they choose Barabbas, and they say, crucify him, he says, why? What evil has he done? And on top of that, his wife sends warning to him to have nothing to do with that righteous man because she had suffered, we don't know the details, but she had suffered much in a dream because of Jesus. So Jesus, our Lord, went from the top to the bottom pretty quickly here. But again, I'll remind you, things are not what they seem. And what I mean by that is you're in a case here where you have somebody who has the authority to judge, and someone's being brought to him, and so you're going to be dealing with innocence and guilt. And the reason that things aren't what they seem is in this account, those who are called guilty are innocent, and those who are called innocent are actually guilty. Let's look at each of the actors here. So Jesus is the obvious one. He's the only person in the account portrayed as guilty, and we know that that's not true. And it's not true in more ways than one. Not only is He not guilty of the specific charges that are being brought against Him by His enemies, But he's guilty of nothing, nothing at all, perfectly innocent and righteous. And we have Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. He's been given authority to carry out capital crimes in the province of Judea. And yet, in this case, he wants to be declared innocent of whatever's going to happen to Jesus, so much so that when he realizes things are getting out of hand, He gets a basin of water and washes his hands and says, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Of course, this doesn't work. Pilate's the only person who has the authority in Judea to say, see to it yourselves. And so he's still responsible for the blood of Jesus. Then we have the crowd. The previously glorifying crowd now crying, crucify him. They're accusing, being led by the Pharisees, but yet still they're accusing Jesus of evil and blasphemy. They accuse Him of trying to challenge the Romans as the King of the Jews. That's the formal charge that's been brought against Jesus, which is an irony of ironies because that's precisely who they thought He was going to be just a few days before. They even want this so badly, they say, His blood be on us and on our children, which again, things are not quite what they seem because His blood will be on their children, but not in judgment and guilt, but to wash away their sins. They're willing to take on the guilt of Jesus' death, but again, things are not what they seem. The last group we're going to look at is the disciples. And you may wonder, the disciples aren't really even in here. Well, that's the problem. The disciples have fled. They fled in fear after the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is arrested, and they're nowhere to be found. And then the only instance we really hear about the disciples after that, before Jesus' death, is 
Peter, who in Matthew is pretty much always used to represent the disciples as a whole, denies knowing Jesus three times, and he disappears. Jesus is abandoned and alone. Later, even the women who are with him that minister to him, they're way off at a distance watching these things. The only people near to Jesus are his enemies who seek to destroy him. He's totally alone. He's so alone that when the Romans are going to take him off to Golgotha, they find and force some random guy named Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross because no one of his associates is there to be found. Things are looking bleak for Jesus. Why doesn't he say anything? Why doesn't he speak up? He has the words. He could take care of it. But Jesus is silent because things aren't quite what they seem. Where we see bleakness, glory is growing. Jesus is alone and dying. He is abandoned by all the human people he has preached to, led, and taught. And even in that situation, he's only speaking on his own behalf in a couple of places. In all these verses we've read, he speaks two, possibly three times. The first time he speaks is near the beginning when Pilate says, Are you the king of the Jews? And he affirms by saying, You have said so. And then he doesn't respond to any of the additional charges. And Jesus does not speak again amidst all of the scourging and the torture and the mockery and the spitting all the way until verse 46. Verse 46 is the heart and culmination of this section of verses. The abandonment, the negative center of attention is complete. For one more person abandons Jesus, God the Father. And in that moment, Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And herein lies the key aspect of today's word from God. This is the main key that lets us know things are not what they seem. Even God turns away from Jesus. Now, if it were all of the scummy sinners who are mixing up innocent and guilty, I can get that. They've got an ulterior motive, and we know what it is. But God the Father turns away from Jesus. How could He get innocent and guilty wrong? Well, of course, He doesn't. And at Jesus' death, the truth is revealed at last. Creation cannot bear the death of the Son of God, and it erupts in earthquakes The division between God and man in the temple is torn in two, and life erupts in the face of Jesus' death. Saints who had died in the faith are coming to life, and after His resurrection, they, they go into the city and appear before many people. The innocent has been pronounced guilty. But the key is this hasn't happened just by the wicked and the guilty, but by God Himself. Well, you may have guessed who we are in the story. We're the guilty. We're the people who appear innocent on the sidelines, lobbying the judgments on the wicked. But we're guilty. We have ignored the Son of God's teaching and His words. And we, like the crowds, we love to sing His praises and glorify Him with adulations when He's doing what we think He should do, when He's showing up to do the thing that we want Him to do, and then as soon as He asks us to do something other than that, something we don't expect, to endure some suffering we cannot stomach, we quickly turn, turn on Him. We accuse Him of guilt that really is our own. But here's the crazy thing. And here's where the things really aren't what they seem. It is the Father's will that He takes your guilt anyways. Even though you have no right to accuse Jesus, to blame your own sin and guilt upon Him, He takes it into Himself nonetheless. 
This is why he isn't speaking up for himself. His silence is speaking for you. He takes the accusations, the insults, and the mistreatment of all of the characters in the story and yours, and the actual guilt of your sins, of the crowd's sins, of Pharisees' sins, of Pilate's sins, and He takes them to the cross, and the innocent truly becomes guilty. This is why God turns away from Him and forsakes Him, for that was what was intended for you and for me. And we're left wondering, why? Why would you do that? Why would you do that for me? And the answer is simple. Because He loves you. And He wants to save you from yourselves. The punishment that you are due for your own sins. This is why Jesus doesn't speak up for Himself. This is why He is abandoned by everyone, including God the Father so that you will never be abandoned and alone. Even today, things are not what they seem. Even now, this great reversal is true. When you feel alone and abandoned, you aren't, because Jesus took that total abandonment in your place. God will never forsake you because He forsook His own Son on the cross. When you feel that your sins isolate you from God, when the world accuses you of wickedness or your friends betray you, God will not. Why? Because things are not what they seem. The innocent are guilty, and the, gu the guilty are innocent. Jesus has taken your guilt and given you His perfect innocence. Not just of the sins that you can think of and remember, but all of them. A total and perfect innocence. Things are not what they seem because when God looks at you, He no longer sees the guilt and shame of your sin, but He sees the perfect righteousness of His Son, Jesus. Today we enter into Holy Week. And Holy Week is a whole week where we focus on what God did in Jesus that didn't really seem like what it was. It seems to focus on a great loss, an epic defeat. The good guys, pronounced guilty despite their innocence, going to the cross, dying a shameful death. And it seems all is lost. That's what His disciples thought. They were in despair. They were fleeing the city of Jerusalem for the one who they thought was the Messiah was dead. But things are not what they seem. The irony is that the people who praised the name of Jesus today on Palm Sunday all those years ago, they were actually right when they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were right to greet him as a conquering king, for conquering he has indeed done. Not some puny enemy like the Roman Empire, but He has conquered sin, death, and the devil. They plague you no more. Your guilt is no more because things are not what they seem. And the guilty have been made innocent by the very blood which the crowd called upon itself, the blood of Jesus. So, Dear friends in Christ, on Easter, the King is going to come again in victory. And victory not over of some small enemy, but the great enemy that opposes each and every one of us. Sin in the world and in ourselves is defeated. It's guilt wiped away because Jesus took that guilt on Himself and paid the price that we deserved. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we don't often really understand the depth of love you bear for us to give up your only Son, Jesus. Help us this Holy Week as we worship you and remember what you have done for us, the mighty work of salvation in Jesus. Help it remind us that when things 
are not going well, when we feel down and guilty because of what we've done, remind us that things are not what they seem. That because of what Jesus did on the cross and His victory over death and the grave, we who were once guilty have now been declared innocent by the blood of the Lamb who was slain. May the peace that passes our understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus until He returns to make everything new. Amen.